Welcome back to Coast to Coast AM. From sea to shining sea, across this great nation and around the world. My name is Rob Simone, filling in for George Nori. And it is open lines. It's Friday, and we've got a lot packed in. I got a call earlier today to do the show. And I thought, you know, I always like to do something different. So since I do a, a weekly radio show, I dipped into my little black book of contacts, and I wanted to bring somebody on who's never been on before. And we have just such a person. He is, what can I say, remarkable. I, I met him briefly uh, when I was traveling around uh, during uh, doing some speaking engagements. And he stands alone, really, in the category that he is known for. He is the world's smartest man. His IQ has been measured uh, by 2020 and other uh, groups to be somewhere between 195 and 210. That is no small potatoes. Moreover, he's into the kind of things that we're into. He, he has a broad-reaching mind. He has really applied himself to the mysteries of the universe. So he makes an excellent guess, and we're going to talk to him in just a few moments. He's come up with a theory. I want you all to listen and call in and ask him about it. It's called the Cognitive Theoretical Model of the Universe. And when the world's smartest man has a theory about the universe, that is what I want to listen to. And I just want to give a quick shout-out. I hope everyone's doing okay. We've had some really crazy weather. Uh, Christmas alone, there were 30 tornadoes, winds up to 100 miles an hour. And as we talk right now, I hope you're warm and safe and dry, 65% of the lower 48 states are covered in snow. So I hope you guys are faring well. And I want to get right to our guest and right to your phone calls. It's open lines for the rest of the show. So sit back, dial in, because we're going to have a fun ride. Let's come right back with Christopher Michael Landing, the smartest man in America. Welcome back to Coast to Coast AM. Rob Simone here filling in for George Nori. And we're about to bring on... Our first guest, he's never been on the show before, but I thought, well, let's do something a little bit different. His name is Christopher Michael Langdon. He was uh, reported to have a IQ over 200 uh, by 2020, and he rose to prominence in 1999, uh, being called the world's smartest man, and also working as a bouncer at a bar in Long Island. He's developed his own theory of the relationship between mind and reality which he calls the Cognitive Theoretic Model of the Universe. Christopher Michael Langdon, welcome to Coast to Coast AM. I'm uh, pleased to be here, Rob. Thank you. You know, it was through synchronicity that uh, our paths crossed, and uh, I just had a short notice. I'm really uh, thankful that you came on the program on such short notice. And no problem. Now, let's get into this. You, Your story is obviously unique and original, and I want to give people a little a snapshot of who you are. Uh, can you tell us a little bit where you were an ordinary kid at some point? You must have been. And how did you get identified as having a large capacity of intellect? Uh, well, you know, it's uh, one of those things where uh, a child learns to read uh, very early. He, he shows signs of precocity. And uh, people just figured that I was uh, a little bit accelerated, smarter than average. And uh, so it, uh, you know, I skipped a few grades in school, that kind of thing. But uh, my IQ wasn't actually measured until relatively uh, late uh, in life. So I didn't really know that I had a super a high IQ, supposedly, until, uh, well, actually it was right around the time of uh, uh, 2020 hmm. uh, uh, measured me. And uh, that was uh, when I learned that I <clears throat> had an extremely high IQ. And you're about how old? Uh, at this point in time, about 60. Okay, and when you were measured by 2020, how old were you? Uh, well, let me see. That was about, uh, I was in 1999. So I'll say about uh, 47, 48 years old. Mm -hmm. And how did you come to their attention? Uh, there was a, uh, it was through the high IQ community. You know, there are a lot of uh, clubs out there. Mensa, and uh, there are a number of higher clubs that have higher cutoffs. And uh, I was uh, a member of, uh, of some of those clubs um, as well. Okay. Um, 
uh, there are uh, experimental tests that these these organizations use to to uh, get their their members, and uh, I had taken a number of these tests, scored very well on them. So now, of course, it's it's uh, it's put, it's put somewhere between 195 and 210 IQ. Now, just just to touch on this briefly, you're it's so high that really there's not a measurement to to pinpoint it it's it's simply projected i mean you, there's you're literally in such a small percentile that these standardized tests really don't even are not even accurate uh right well once you once you break the ceilings of uh of uh the standardized iq tests then they can't measure your iq you're said to be off the charts and at that point all they can do is extrapolate yeah yeah well you've had before you were, were labeled in such a way, you had a really hard time in school. You found it what not challenging. You were, you know, just not engaged. Uh, well, as a matter of fact, I had a hard time paying attention in class. I wasn't uh, wasn't engaged. Uh, what I really needed to do was have my course of study. But of course, they they made me sit in class all day, <laughs> along with all the rest of the kids. And uh, I quickly became bored because I, I I guess I was learning a little bit too quickly, and uh, it it became rote repetition very early on because of that and uh, I used to fall asleep all the time in class as a matter of fact yeah so people are probably wondering how many degrees do you have and how far did you get how many uh, post doctorates do you have well I suppose I have maybe a year's worth of college credit no, that's it so what made you disengage from the academic process uh, I didn't really have much choice in the matter I had a scholarship when I first went away to college uh, I, I had applied to two colleges I got two full ride scholarships and uh, um, uh, uh, there was a, uh, a certain amount of paperwork that had to be filled out because I was underage. I was under 18. The paperwork has to be filled out by your parents in order to certify, recertify your scholarship. And unfortunately, that paperwork uh, managed to get lost. But, but there were a number of problems besides this, though. Um, you know, one thing or another uh, probably would have conspired to make sure that I, I didn't return to college after my first year. Hmm. And you think the reason is that is because you didn't have the sort of expected academic pedigree? Well, no. There were a number of, of problems. Uh, there were uh, personality conflicts with a couple of instructors. I had a couple of real bad ones. Mm. Uh, I had a lot of culture shock. I was here. I was a, a kind of a ranch kid. I'd been working on farms and ranches, and uh, I was, uh, had a crew cut, and very clean cut kid. And I show up at school, and here are these these long haired kids, urban kids. Um, with a, a completely different presentation than I had, and it kind of uh, yeah, there was a little bit of culture shock there. Mm. So I re didn't really felt like I fit in. I was a little bit alienated. Yeah. And uh, you know, as I say, one thing and another, I didn't really feel in place there. Yeah, but you really have kind of a, a disdain for the whole academic academic bureaucracy, as you call it, right? Yeah, I noticed you almost said academy, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a disdain for it. Uh, 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 let's just put it this way. There, there are an awful lot of smart people in academia. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I didn't meet too many of them when I went away uh, to college. It all depends on what kind of luck you have, really. Yeah. And uh, uh, I found that uh, as a bureaucracy, academia isn't very forthcoming. It doesn't really care who you are, what you know, what you're capable of. It's all very mass production oriented. And this is something into which I... I uh, a mind like mine doesn't fit very well. Hmm. Okay. So, just to get a snapshot of your life in general, uh, when you were, say, in your 20s, did you disengage from society? Did you find yourself just finding refuge in books and things like that? Well, uh, I wasn't independently wealthy, and uh, one can't really find refuge in books if one has to go out and work for a living. So, really, what I had to do was, uh, you know, go out and make sure I had enough money to pay the rent. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this led me into uh, various lines of work. Uh, I read a lot in my spare time, of course, but sometimes I didn't really have very good books at hand. Working on the country, on the sticks, no bookstores, no libraries, and uh, that kind of thing. Hmm. Okay, so you basically were just a uh, working fellow, and and that carried you through your 20s and 30s? Uh, well, uh, yeah. Well, we can say so, uh, something like that. I mean, there were a lot of uh, different jobs I had, and of course, I was involved in self-study all the time. If I found a question interesting, I'd, I'd research it. Mm -hmm. I spent a lot of time by myself that way. Okay. And where did your mind usually go? What sort of 
problems, what sort of concepts did you find yourself thinking about more often than not? Uh, usually mathematics and philosophy. That's what I actually intended to major in, in college. Mm -hmm. And uh, other, other fields as well. Uh, biology was a special interest. Uh, and pretty much anything I could get my hands on. I wasn't really able to be too picky about what I read. Mm -hmm. There were only uh, certain books at hand usually, and those were, were the ones that I'd read. Didn't you miss, though, having discussions with people in the field? Didn't you miss not being engaged in the process of developing these ideas and putting forward your own theories? Uh, well, yes, of course. No, one wants to communicate with, uh, with uh, one's fellows about what one is thinking, but uh, that's uh, kind of a luxury, and I wasn't really used to it anyway, so uh, I, I didn't feel the, the loss too acutely. Uh, you know, remembering, uh, looking back, uh, I wasn't exactly content about that, but it was something that uh, I was inured to, so I didn't think about it much. Hmm. Okay. Well, what did you end up reading a lot? You said uh, philosophy and mathematics. Uh, were you engaged in trying to solve some of these theorems that have been lying around unsolved? Uh, yeah, I, w I would uh, think a lot about uh, graph theory, mathematics, uh, logic especially. And, uh, uh, yeah, you know, it wasn't as though I went out and tried to find problems that other people were working on. I would decide on a certain, you know, problem that I wanted to know the answer to, and then I would uh, work along those lines, solving problems as they came up, uh, as I had to. Mm -hmm. Whatever problems, uh, usually to get to the solution of one problem, you need to solve other problems along the way, and those problems arise out of necessity. So it's not as though I had to go look for problems. Okay. And you also study a little bit of uh, Egyptology, I understand? Well, that was when I was very young. My, my grandparents had a bookshelf, and uh, in the, the shelf were a number of books, and one of those was a compendium on Egyptology. Mm -hmm. So I read that one. Well, I was, must have been five or six years old. Okay. So are you someone who's really good at looking at the micro and the macro? I mean, if you're in the working environment, do your thoughts go toward conventional society and then at different times you're involved in something very specific? Uh, well, yes. Yeah, of course, the older I get, the more macro it gets. I need reading glasses at this point. But uh, yeah. uh, as far as widening and narrowing my scope, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes I have to take a big picture view. Other times I'm looking more at the details. You've always got to try to achieve an interplay between those two extremes. Mm -hmm. Now, I've heard it said uh, by you that a good example of someone with a very high intellect such as yours uh, is that you're able to hold in your mind at one time many different scenarios in all of the uh, processes that they uh, are involved in at one time. Is that sort of a safe to say where your expertise really shows itself? Uh, well, I don't know if you could call that expertise. It's just, it's something about, uh, it says something about neural capacity your ability uh well yeah in a matter of speaking you're just you're just holding certain things that you're running certain mental processes simultaneously i don't want to call it multitasking because it, it, these the tasks aren't independent they're all interrelated around one central theme or concept and all of these things have to go on in your mind simultaneously otherwise you're forgetting things that you need to know in order to run these other processes so mm -hmm. in a holistic way yes this is what's happening is that anything like predictive software, where you can create a model and play out different scenarios? Well, models uh, involve varying degrees of parallelism. Some models are highly parallel, which means they have a number of sub-processes running simultaneously, and uh, other models are more or less sequential. Uh, they follow one step after another. Um, it really kind of varies with uh, whatever kind of problem you're working on. Hmm. Yeah, I imagine so. Well, okay, the reason I ask you about the micro and macro is because I'm wondering, in all that you take in and you're, and you're able to see, you know, everyday life, you, you've probably, you know, been inundated with television and media just like the rest of us, what have you discovered uh, that is untrue that the average uh, person might accept as reality? Well, there are a number of, uh, a number of examples, I suppose. A lot of people think that things actually move from one point in space to another, but if you know anything about relativity theory, for example, you know that, that whenever you're looking outside yourself, you're actually looking into the past, which means that whatever you see with your eyes, whatever is outside your body, uh, that has already happened. And since everything has already happened outside yourself, nothing can really move from one point to another outside you. 
So it's all, in a sense, happening internally. When something moves, when, when states transform one into the other, this is happening in a dynamic realm that you're not necessarily seeing or perceiving with your eyes. That's one common uh, way in which people are, are kind of misled by their senses. Hmm. So you're saying when something moves, it's not the thing moving, it's your mind? Uh, not exactly. What I'm saying is that there is a theater, there's a wider reality, one part of which can be called uh, outward or physical and the other which are, uh, of which can be called mental, and that most of the dynamics in that system, most of the change, is actually happening in the mental aspect of the system. So if I'm on a highway and a tractor trailer goes by me at 75 miles an hour, where in my concept of reality Am I wrong to think that it was actually moving by me and now it's gone? Well, the tractor is is, is approaching you from the future, right? It's not. Uh, there's a there's a sense in which the tractor is not really the the, the truck, whatever it is that you're passing, uh, is is not actually outside. You, each state of the of the of the uh, of the truck that you perceive as each moment passes in a, is in a sense brand new. In other words, it's being determined at the present time. Now some things are deterministic, which means that they project themselves into this mental realm an arbitrary distance. They have a world line that, that penetrates far into this, uh, into this realm. And in that case, you can kind of say, well, okay, they might as well be outside me because their trajectory has been determined by laws of physics. But those laws of physics are actually acting in an, in, uh, an internal realm, in a sense. As I say, once, once you perceive something outside yourself, it's already in the past. Light has to travel from the event to your eyes, and that means that it has already happened. It's, uh, it's out there in your past. So when you see something, it's already passward. Oh, that that, okay. You understand what I'm saying? I get what you're saying, and we're talking in such a small fraction of time. But you're saying even the smallest amount of delay puts it in the past. Therefore, everything is in the past because everything that enters into your sight has to involve light bouncing off of it. Right. In other words, there's something called observer participation. When you perceive an event outside yourself, in a sense, you're helping to generate that event. Okay. This is, this is well known to people who are interested in quantum mechanics and this kind of thing. Well, it's also said in quantum mechanics that the act of observing it changes it. If someone was blindfolded on the highway... That wouldn't be possible, by the way, if it were already re d determined. You can see that. Well, okay, well, what I was going to say is if the person's blindfolded and the truck actually hits them, wouldn't that be representative of, some, of something moving regardless of when it happens? As I say, the truck has a physical trajectory determined by physical laws, but these things are actually acting into the future. Ah. You see what I mean? Yeah, it gets pretty dicey, doesn't it, um, in this quantum world where with these electrons floating around. And, and, and if Heisenberg was so uncertain, how can we be certain? <laughs> well, it's, it's, not, it's not quite as difficult as all that. Yeah, that's a little quantum it's physics. Uncertainty joke. has to do with, with uh, conjugate observables and what you can observe at any given time. You, can you observe the... The, uh, the perfect position and uh, the perfect momentum of a particle at once, and, and that's what uncertainty is dealing with. Okay. Uh, some uh, macroscopic objects are governed by laws of physics, you see, and, and they're, they're kind of determined well into the future. So they might as well be coming at you from outside. Okay. Uh, any other things that you have uh, discovered that the average person, you know, maybe something a little more... Uh, useful to the average person that um, they would think is normal or reality that's really not? Well, you've got a lot of uh, background processes running in your mind. Consciousness is a funny thing. Okay. Uh, you, you're uh, aware of one uh, moment uh, passing into the next, that your conscious mind is, but in reality your mind is kind of working in a, in a larger sense. It's working over larger areas of time. And uh, this is uh, the nature of causation it kind of tends to be distributed over time this way. So that is a little bit counterintuitive. People think they're just passing from one uh, event to the next, and they're not. Mm. And how could someone use that knowledge to improve their life? Uh, you know, it, this is not something that I've necessarily thought about. Uh, one can, of course, uh, the... the, the the better you understand reality, the better you can adapt to reality and fit into it. 
And uh, it really does get kind of complex when you think about reality in this way. Hmm. So as far as wisdom that you can simply take from, uh, from deep insight into reality, this is uh, the particular class of phenomena that we're talking about right now doesn't really lend itself to that kind of analysis. Right. Well, hold it there for a moment. We're going to come up on the break, and when we come back, we're going to talk about more of this alternate take on reality. And I wonder where intuition comes into this, metaphysics, religion, and much more. This is Coast to Coast AM. My name is Rob Simone. Don't go anywhere. We're coming right back with Christopher Michael Landon, the smartest man in America. Yes, we are back talking with the smartest man in America. So it says 2020 and many others. Christopher Michael Langdon. And this is an interesting topic because I, mean, I have so many questions. That's why we're going to be taking phone calls in a, in a few moments. But it just, it just makes me wonder, uh, Christopher, I mean, are you very cerebral? Are you tied to logic like Spock? Or do you have... A very intuitive side too. Do you listen to your heart, in other words? Uh, well, yes, of course. I I listen to my feelings, just like anybody else does. Uh, if you really take a look at the way human beings think and act, you'll see that logic is usually subservient to feelings, rather than vice versa. Uh, Spock, uh, if Spock were really subservient to logic alone, Spock would be nothing but a computer. A computer is a machine, whereas we're conscious beings, so feelings always all have something to do with our thought processes. That's part of what makes us human. Hmm. Do you find yourself wanting to be secluded from the attachments of life, of family, so that you can just pursue these intellectual things? Uh, well, uh, actually, I'm happily married, and uh, I do like a certain amount of company, of course. Uh, there was a time in my life, however, when I, was, uh, I really kind of preferred to be alone. I was, for example, a Forest Service lookout. Hmm. Uh, and what a lookout does is he sits in a lookout tower all summer yeah. looking for fires. And there is no one around for miles and miles, and I was perfectly happy uh, that way. I guess I have more of a tolerance for being alone than most people do, but I, I appreciate human company. Yeah. Did you discover any great truths, in other words, that you might think that a person would really benefit from hearing? Uh. Well, there are all kinds of, of great truth. Uh, there is such a thing, well, let's talk about truth itself. There is such a thing as absolute truth. A lot of people think that uh, truth is something relative, that we all find our own truths, that uh, never the twins shall meet, that we don't really intersect in a common body of truth, uh, anything that we can prove to be absolutely the case. But in fact, there are uh, uh, ways in which the truth is absolute, <clears throat> and this is largely what I study. How so? Well, uh, for instance, we all share perception, and, uh, and that means that we're looking out and we're seeing uh, the same things outside. And we can know the truth partially by direct, direct replicated perception. That's what the scientific method says. And there has got to be a common basis for that. It couldn't possibly happen unless we all had uh, certain sets of categories and relationships in our minds according to which we organize experience. So this is one example of absolute truth. Do you think that human beings are all tied together by some sort of field of mind? Well, of course they are. That's, that's partially what this perceptual syntax that I just talked about is. It's distributed over everybody. It's a, it's a common field, uh, uh, one could say, uh, that distributes over everybody's mind, and it holds us all together. Is this field able to communicate energy and or information? Well, in this field, this field has a property called mathematical closure, so it, it, has, it contains all of its own energy, all of its own information. Everything is conserved and recycled, and yet it is transformed and changed in the process. Is this field uh, theoretical, or is it measurable? Uh, whenever you look at anything in the universe or measure anything, obviously you're dealing with the universe, therefore you are dealing with this field. Science is based on, as I say, a common body of perception, and this... Uh, the wherewithal of common perception distributes over all of us. So uh, this uh, field is definitely measurable, and as a matter of fact, measurement itself would not be possible without it. Hmm. So it's been measured, and can we point to any sort of study to, to reference this? 
All you have to do is uh, look outside. You're probably sitting at a desk. You've probably got monitors around. You've probably got a phone. The mere fact that you are perceiving these things means that you are partaking in the field of which we're speaking. Ah, okay. So you're not talking about uh, Dr. Carl Jung when he talked about the collective unconscious that was this common pool of experience that was somehow available to everybody just because they were human. Well, you, you know, you're talking about Jungian archetypes, racial memories, things that are things that are embedded in the race. I'm talking about the actual dynamic, phenomenological act of perception in the present. Hmm. All right, where you're using basically a set of cognitive uh, mental categories and, and mental relationships to organize your experience in real time. I mean, you're doing it right now. Uh, in quantum mechanics, you know, measurement, you don't necessarily have to attach a, a value to something. Any interaction with, with the environment, any interaction between a measurement device and a system or between an observer and a system, that is that constitutes a measurement, whether or not you're taking a number out of it. Right? So essentially you are measuring reality simply by perceiving it. And we could say that there is a quantum field associated with this, and that's the field we're talking about. Hmm. So the fact that we are able to perceive reality means that we are tied in to this universal field. Well, yeah, obviously. John, John Wheeler used to talk, uh, the, uh, the great physicist, the great uh, uh, general relativist, John Wheeler used to wonder at the marvel of why we all perceive the same universe. Why one universe instead of many is the way he put it. And that's a very good question, isn't it? Why don't I perceive my own universe and you perceive your own universe? We've got to be tied together somehow. Hmm. What, what travels the fastest in, our, in, the, in the universe? What, what travels the fastest? Yeah. Well, if we refer back to what I said about motion not being not being external, traveling the fastest is in a way of misnomer. You've actually got to reformulate motion so it's mathematically correct. But obviously light is what is supposed to travel fastest in the universe if you take an ectomorphic view. And I, I talk about these distinctions in the, in the paper I've written. I think I referred you to this paper. You probably have a copy of it there, but I doubt you've had time to read it. Uh, I have, but I'm, the reason I ask that is because I'm wondering if thought travels faster than light. Well, does thought travel? If it comes from somewhere and arrives somewhere, I think a classic definition of travel might be implied. Well, what if it arrives where it started? What if the, what if the starting point expands and then the next state of thought is occurring inside the previous state? Then what would you call that? That would be a morphing uh, reality to which there is no beginning and end. Uh, not exactly. Uh, there's no beginning and end in the sense that, that the origin is distributed in, in such a reality. But, uh, but uh, definitely one thing can proceed to the next. Basically what you're talking about is a, is a new kind of manifold or, or a geometric construct which exists in the CTMU, which is my theory. It's called a conspansive manifold. It's a dual to the ordinary manifold of classical physics. Right, yeah. We're going to talk about that. I just thought I'd maybe query a little bit here and there to, to sort of change up a little. Um, you've studied a bit of metaphysics, right? Uh, a bit of what now? Metaphysics. Oh, uh, yes. Okay. I'm wondering what your opinion is on the commonly held uh, theories of psychic abilities, of telekinesis, remote viewing, things that most people would call supernatural. Is there room in your sort of worldview for things that have such a label? Well, in, in a sense, in, in my worldview, that's what everything is. Everything begins uh, in, in the form of something mental uh, as a kind of internal reality and then is externalized through perception. So everything's available and everything's possible? Uh, well, no, there are constraints okay. uh, that, uh, that limit what is possible, but one heck of a lot more is possible than most people assume. Most people have a very, very concrete, you know, they, they look outside themselves, they see pieces of matter floating around. It's a materialistic universe, so they think, well, this is, what, this is what it all is. No, that's only the output stage of reality. The real, the real guts of reality, which is where it's really happening in reality, is, is in the present and future. It only emerges into the past after the fact. And this is tautological. If you think about it a little bit, you know, that's the only way something can emerge <clears throat> through the present is into the past. Hmm. 
So people who claim to have abilities to see in the future or to talk to people who have <coughs> passed on, the, these are some things that you, things that you find uh, plausible? Well, they're plausible. Of course, I can't say whether or not uh, they're actually occurring in any given instance, mm -hmm. but we can't rule them out. <clears throat> We'd have to rely on, we, we face something called the problem of induction if we try to rule them out, and we're, we're simply not allowed to do that. A lot of people pretend there are a lot of uh, skeptics and cynics around who think, well, of course, this kind of thing is impossible mm -hmm. because we can't, we don't have replicable instances of it. But that's empirical induction, and, uh, and as Hume knew, empirical induction is a, is a, a, a puddle of quicksand. We can't necessarily grasp anything solid there, which is why in science all we can do is confirm theorems and confirm speculations. We can never actually prove anything except by direct perception. Hmm. As soon as we start using inference and developing theories about why things happen, we're in no man's land. We can't really verify what we're thinking about. Hmm. Still, uh, it sounds like you're kind of open. You have a, <coughs> I don't know what I might describe, a holistic uh, the mind is a, is a wonderful thing. As a matter of fact, the universe, the entire universe, is a mind. We're simply not in a position to to circumscribe the abilities of that mind. It can no doubt do marvelous things that uh, that uh, the standard, uh, you know, an ordinary scientist is not going to be able to get his mind around. Hmm. What about the idea of this divine nature that the human being seems to be hardwired? to identify with. What are your thoughts on... Seems to be hardwired for what? Excuse me. For the notion of uh, a God, of a, of, of a power <laughs> beyond uh, ourselves. Uh, where do you stand on this widely held notion of God coming down to earth, talking to people, uh, providing a son, the, the whole sort of pantheon of this divine contact that we have written so many books about and people uh, you know, have devoted so much of their lives to? Uh, well, if we talk about uh, uh, the just talk about the predicate reality, it's it's a characteristic predicate of of the system of perceptions and uh, and thoughts that we have around us. Mm -hmm. Basically, that constitutes a kind of identity, and everything in the system is an image of that identity, and that includes us. So God is walking the earth every day in the form of 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 men. Now we're not equivalent to God because we're localized. We don't have this this global perception, this global cognition that God has. But in a sense, we're images of God. And as far as God having a uh, a special son is concerned, that means that that simply means that the son has a higher form of self that is more closely connected to the identity uh, than we are. And of course, that's a that's a common religious perception in monotheism. Mm. Your theory, cognitive theoretic model of the universe. Uh, can you give people just a quick overview of what that is and how that kind of relates to that? The cognitive theoretic model of the universe, uh, well, it consists of, of three ingredients. One of them is cognitive theory, one of them is universe, and one of them is model. You can think of the cognitive theory as being a description of the universe, which is a set of perceptions. And then you can think about the model as being the descriptive mapping that ties the two together. <clears throat> Ordinarily, a theory is separate from the universe and the model. But if you take those three ingredients and you tie them together, you fuse them, you contract them into one underlying entity, then you get the CTMU. That's how the CTMU is quantized. All three of these things are brought together. Mm. And you, you stress language quite a bit, how a lot of this is based on language. It's sort of the key. It's the medium for which all discoveries uh, are brought forth. Is, am I close to accurately uh, interpreting that? Well, uh, yes, in the sense that a, a language, a lot of people think that, well, a language is simply something that we speak that comes out of your mouth. It's not. It's an algebraic structure. It actually... Has, uh, has elements of operations, and it's a form of algebra. But it's a very general form of algebra because anything that we can think about and formulate, obviously, is a language. It's got to conform to the rules of language. Otherwise, it's unintelligible. So in a, in a sense, language is the most general algebraic structure. Therefore, when we talk about the most likely algebraic structure to apply to the universe as a whole, it's definitely got to be language because that's the most general. In other words, reality has to be a language. And this goes together with bringing all three of those ingredients, language, universe, and model together. Obviously, the structure of each is a part of the whole, characterizes the whole distributively. Yes. Well, 
When you say it like that, I guess it has to make sense. Um, hold it right there. We're going to take a quick break. We'll come back. We'll take some phone calls. And I want to ask you about the NSA and about any government influence that you have might encountered, as so many people with such a high intellect purport to have experience. You're listening to Coast to Coast AM. We're coming right back. Quick break. Welcome back to Coast to Coast AM. We're talking with Christopher Michael Langdon, Langdon and his website right now, ctmu.org, is linked up through coasttocoastam.com. Uh, and we've got a bunch of phone calls uh, that we want to get to, uh, Christopher. But I just want to ask you, so often we hear from people who are gifted uh, with a high intellect that are approached from these ABC agencies to work for the NSA to do code breaking. Anything like that ever happened to you? Um, not exactly. No. Uh, the, these alphabet agencies are only interested in, in candidates that come out of the education system. They come out of the university system. <clears throat> Oftentimes, well, what the CIA is famous for recruiting people out of the Ivy League, for instance. Uh, they're not really paying attention to uh, people that are outside that system. Mm -hmm. And you have a organization that's designed to help uh, gifted children uh, excel in an environment that might well, get not... Well, children and adults. We and adults. Okay. We don't, we don't discriminate by age. Oh, good. Very good. Uh, and help them, identify them, and help them if they are, are not very well suited in the position that they're in. Well, well, exactly. I mean, the people, as we discussed before, the gifted people tend to feel isolated because they're, they're above the curve. They're out on the tail of the curve, and they, and they can't really communicate, especially well with other people who can't understand their thoughts and feelings. They find it more, the more, uh, uh, they more readily communicate with each other. But of course, gifted people are relatively rare, so there's usually not a gifted person around with whom you can communicate. So the idea is to set up a, a network <clears throat> or web where gifted people can communicate with each other without any academic snobbery associated with it. Okay, let's go. Uh west of the Rockies. I think we have Sherry from New York. Welcome to Coast to Coast AM. Uh, Sherry, are you there? Yes. Okay, go ahead. What's your question? Thank you. Sure. Um, this is, um, I am not of any high IQ or anything like that. I don't want to imply that. But something happened to me, and since you seem to have such a real good grasp of mind, I, it never occurred to me before to ask someone, but thought I'd ask. After college, I pursued a course of self-study that lasted, I'd say, about 20, 22 years. So you're an autodidact. I don't know <laughs> what you're that so, is. You're, you're, you're but at so. any rate, I don't think the subject matter is, is relevant. Um, I, after about 20 two years, I reached a point where I could read something and understand it, or people would be talking about something, and I would understand it, but in such a... An abstract way? A, a, a broad, whole way. So you're automatically relating it to other things that you know? Yes. Tying them all together in your head. And it, Yes. And, and every, everything would all come together at once in my head. <clears throat> and I lost all language ability on the subject. Does that make sense? I, 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 like, I yeah, to, to some extent, language is linear. And when you have a network of associations like this, and that is a parallel process. The brain is massively parallel. All of your neurons are wired in, in, in parallel. So basically what you're doing is you're getting away from the linear, uh, the linear nature of language and you're associating everything in parallel. So, yes, it, it does make sense to a certain extent. Yeah, it's kind of a good uh, right brain, left brain kind of question. Um, well, we got another really good one here. Uh, Rob from, uh, let's see, Van, uh, Vancouver. Uh, welcome to the Coast to Coast I Am. Yo, man, great. I've got a question for Mr. Langan. Sure. About, uh, there's two different terms for the same thing. One is a backward flow of time from the near future to the present, as discussed by Dean Radin. 
The other, uh, sometimes it's called retrocausation, which is a backward flow of time from the present to unmeasured things in the past, as discussed by Terence McKenna. And I'm wondering if Mr. Uh, Langan can, dis dis uh, can explain anything about this, uh, what seems to be an observed phenomenon. Okay, well, let's get that answer when we come back, and we'll repeat it. This is Coast to Coast AM. You're listening to Christopher Michael Langan, and he is considered the smartest man in America. We're taking more of your phone calls, stretching it out one more half hour. Keep it right here. You're listening to Coast to Coast AM. Welcome back to the program here. And we are in the midst of, well, one of the most intellectual discussions I have had in quite a long time. We're talking with someone who's been billed as the smartest man in America. Well, if you had an IQ of over 200, you would be billed in just the same way. His name is Christopher Michael Langan, and he is talking with us today about, well, a lot of different subjects. His website is linked up right now at Coast to Coast AM, and we had a really good question right before the break. Rob from Vancouver was calling in, and Rob, go ahead and say that again, because uh, I think, you know, you had a really good, succinct uh, 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 question that we want to get to. Go ahead. Yeah, okay. Um, there have been some experiments that seem to show that mental effort in the present can affect things that happened in the past that haven't been measured yet. Uh, this is called retrocausation. And I believe it's the same thing as theories that people have, like, like Dr. Dean Radin, who's way out on the cutting edge in these things, where uh, he's convinced that events in the future can affect the present. It looks to be the same kind of backward flow of time. I'm wondering uh, if Mr. Langan can explain this at all. Uh, well, <clears throat> what you're talking about is the duality of time. And mathematics duality is when you have two oppositely directed arrows or you have one arrow that functions in two directions, you're talking about something that is dual. Time is dual in this sense. Causation flows forward, but along that same arrow, it is able to flow back. And there are a number of formulations of this. You have uh, Wheeler-Feynman uh, absorber emitter theory and uh, the uh, Kramer interpretation of quantum mechanics. Um, uh, there, there are a number of different ways of looking at this, but the, the bottom line is that retrocausation is real, and this has to do with causation actually distributing <clears throat> over large sectors of space and time rather than being something that happens only in the present. Now, is this something that all humans have the ability to engage in, or is this maybe selected to people with certain characteristics? It is, it is the nature of causation, so we have no choice, actually, but to participate in this and partake of it. Hmm. That's essentially what we are. <clears throat> we make causation happen in this way. It's how it happens in the brain and how it happens outside the brain as well. There have been these random number generator experiments that were put on by the Noetic Institute of Science where people were looking at random numbers and causing them to formulate certain patterns, and some of them were even doing it without their knowledge. Uh, given series of numbers that had been generated weeks before. Is this an example of how the mind is, is able to engage this quantum world that is outside of linear time? It could be an example that's within the realm of possibility and would be covered by by what we're talking about, which in the CTMU is formulated telecausation. And that's been around for 30 years. I don't know if anybody else is on the cutting edge of it, but the, the CTMU has been around since the 1980s. So uh, this dual causation has been a part of it from the beginning. Hmm. Okay. Uh, let's go to uh, Georgia, uh, the wild card line. Uh, Rick, you are on Coast to Coast AM. Welcome. Hello. I'm enjoying this. Uh, I, I just had a, couple, uh, had a comment and a question. Uh, my comment is that uh, it seems to me that uh, all of academic science is uh, they're embraced uh, they've embraced uh, dogma of <coughs> that uh, theories of, that have not been proven but they embrace them as dogma in uh, just about every uh, uh, discipline of uh, science has done this and uh, that's my comment my, my question is uh, uh, what do you think of uh, the electric universe theory uh, 
I think that makes a lot more sense than the uh, gravitational uh, uh, universe theory. And you know, I'll I'll hang up and listen to the comments. <laughs> Uh, yes, well, first of all, I, I agree with your comment. Uh, academia runs on orthodoxy. Academic consensus is uh, is very important to academics, so they'll have to agree on certain things. And the theories that are chosen are <clears throat> usually chosen according to some kind of departmental hierarchy where the guys in charge believe a certain way. And if you're a, you're a uh, less influential professor that is working under them, you'd better have the same view of reality. Otherwise, you're not you're not moving far. Your academic career is going to stagnate. Okay, very well. We'll hold it right there uh, for a moment, Christopher. When we come back, we're going to talk to uh, Marissa, and she's going to ask you about the reason behind this ma mathematical proof of God and much more questions. Listen to Coast to Coast AM. Stay right there. Welcome back to Coast to Coast AM. And, uh, Christopher, I, I wonder, do you go after the big questions? Are you you know, sort of preoccupied with, you know, questions like why are we here and uh, how did we get here? Well, I already know the answers to these questions, so I'm, uh, I'm actually preoccupied with filling in the details. Uh, the, in order to explain these things, you've actually got to have a pretty big theory, which means that you've got to keep on working on it, developing the details at all times. Even when you answer certain questions, that causes other questions to arise, so you're in a constant state of toil. Huh. Uh, within a worldview like that, and yeah, uh, you'd have to say that I'm kind of obsessed with it. I spend every day working on it. Of course, I have a <clears throat> horse ranch here, so I'm outside a lot, and we've got a lot of things going on with the foundation and so forth, but uh, I spend uh, several hours every day working on the theory and developing it. Yeah. yeah. All right, I'll ask you that, but first let's go to Marissa from uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Welcome to Coast to Coast AM. Oh, thank you, thank you. Sure. I actually have uh, my first question, and another one is sparked from listening to you. The first question is, um, I had done a little research on you before listening, and there was something that you had stated saying that you have come up with a mathematical proof, not only for the existence of some sort of God, but for proof of an afterlife. So I was wondering if you could kind of delve into that, and then building off something that you said earlier, um, talking about that everything that is in existence, I believe how you worded it was that um, has been the start of some sort of mental process that comes from the mind. So I was wondering if you could explain that in relation to God or some sort of deity or some sort of higher power and what you'd believe as far as if that deity or if that um, standard of differentiation, um, if that developed in the mind, um, what that means for revelation from above and what that means of our view of what God is or what you would want to call it for this standard, if those make sense. Uh, well, you've just <clears throat> asked a whole lot of questions. The last one I couldn't quite hear. It might be this phone or something. But uh, you you uh, talk about uh, your, your, your questions tie this proof of God that I'm working on. And actually, there are several. There are going to be several contained in this book with, uh, with the mental aspect of God. And the fact of the matter is, as I say, God is uh, something that would be considered analogous to a mind. And uh, uh, could you uh, rephrase the second part of your question for me so I can understand it, please? As far as if you're saying that there's some sort of deity or some sort of standard or some sort of what God is, if that's just a product of what humanity has developed in the mind, then how um, that's not different or how then that is a constant or if what man has had a revelation of who God is and what this God means, if that has been given to you given to our mind or given to our mental processes by something from above, if it was something transcendent or if it's something that we have come up with in our own mental processes. Uh, so you're asking whether God is something that exists for all time or whether God is somehow emergent through human cognition, and the answer is both. Yeah. Uh, causation is telic, as I explained before, which means that it distributes over large swaths of time. The highest causation would be called teleology. And uh, this would be associated with uh, God or divine mind. And, of course, uh, things are emergent. Uh, even the distributed identity of this universe emerges piece by piece in different areas. So an understanding of God is emerging in the mind of man. Does that answer your question? Well, I'm, we're, we're moving uh, too quick to, uh, to get a, a response to that because we're uh, going through these calls. But just in between, let me ask you this, uh, uh, Christopher. Do you believe that there are other intelligent uh, species scattered throughout maybe our own galaxy in the universe? I believe it's highly plausible, but I also believe that there is a problem associated with the maximality of the speed of light in getting them here physically. However, this doesn't rule out 
<clears throat> telepathic communication of some sort or uh, or communication involving uh, quantum tunneling or something of that nature. Right. Uh, do you think life uh, as we know it, humanity, humans, uh, have grown organically from the basic elements that were deposit deposited on this planet? Or do you think that there was some sort of intervention by another species not indigenous to Earth? I prefer to think in terms that are invariant with respect to the answers to questions like that. In other words, uh, since we don't, since we can't know this for sure, uh, it is most productive for us to, to look for a framework or a worldview in which the answer to that question uh, does not make any difference, in which it's been superseded by larger issues. Hmm. All right. Well, let's keep going deeper down the rabbit hole. Bill. <laughs> From West Hartford, Connecticut, you're on Coast to Coast AM. Yes, yes. Hi, Rob. Hi. Yes, hi. Hi, Mr. Langan. Hi. I'm glad coming after that last caller because I'm an atheist myself, and I'm very scientific-minded. I'm an amateur astronomer. I'm going to give you two quick points uh, why I, I would say, number one, Jesus never existed. I'll explain that. And then point number two deals with the mind. You talked about the mind and the brain. I want to relate that to string theory, which I think is the ultimate field that you talked about earlier, the, the, the sum total of the trillions of strings that make up the human brain. Let me get to point one quickly. Um, Jesus never existed. If he did, he would have to have been a woman, a she, because uh, going by the myth of the virgin birth, and I would call it a myth, if the Genesis, virgin yes. birth had happened, you would have only the egg of Mary with, I guess, the mind of God. So the only physical, uh, biological part is Mary's egg, which is a 2X chromosome equals a woman. You don't have a male sperm, which creates either a man or a woman. So the offspring of Mary, if it were a uh, child of Mary and God, would have to be a female. So okay. since Jesus had never been shown to Well, Bill, let's, let's go with something that uh, Christopher can relate to. Okay, the second part you can relate to. All right, the mind. If every, all, the, the part, all the matter in the universe breaks down ultimately to strings, going by string theory. Uh, That's so a theory. The, the smallest part of the human brain, the neurons, breaks down to electrons and quartz and ultimately to 11-dimensional strings of energy that vibrate in 11 dimensions, meaning in dimensions outside are three dimensions of space and one dimension of time. So my point is, when the person dies, this is something you may or may not have thought about. Could the sum total of all the strings that make up our human brains be the mind, not the soul, I wouldn't call it S-O-U-L, soul, but the mind, could it manifest itself in another dimension, which religious people wrongly and misguidedly call heaven or hell, without hmm. the need of a God? Okay. Yeah. What, what do you think, Christopher? Uh, well, uh, I think that we've got a contradiction in, in terms here. Yes, it can happen. There can be an afterlife. I mean, there, there can be. It is perfectly within the realm of possibility that there are other domains in which, uh, in which minds can exist. But this implies a distributed identity for the universe, uh, a cohesive principle that covers the universe and supports these phenomena, and that would be God. So you can't have one without the other. Hmm. All right, let's keep going. Uh, Larry in Kentucky has been holding for a while. Welcome to Coast to Coast AM. Uh, hello, uh, Christopher. I, I'd like to hear your ideas on something. I'll, take, uh, your, I'll, I'll listen to you off the air. I mean, off the phone. Uh, these recent school shootings that happened in New Jersey, I, I'd like to hear your ideas on a solution to that. The government offered us a couple of solutions, and I'd just like to hear your ideas on it, what you think about it. Hmm. And uh, I appreciate uh, this feedback. Okay. Well, uh, my ideas are, uh, are several. Number one, I think there has been, uh, they've, they found out that a lot of these people are on SSRIs, SNRIs, and uh, I think that this is probably more of a causative factor than, than owning guns. This was a terrible tragedy, by the way, and uh, I would would have stopped it if I could, but I don't think that uh, the Second Amendment should be abridged because of it or anything like it. I think that, uh, what, what, there's an old saying, the greatest mass murders in history are governments, and this is why the Second Amendment exists, so that people can defend themselves against any future form of tyranny. Hmm. So, so we have to keep this in mind that as much as a, of a tragedy as some of these things are, I don't think that we need to abridge the Constitution because of them. Hmm. Well, just going on this uh, for a little bit further, if you were sort of in control, you, would you, uh, you think that uh, this world is overpopulated? And, and do you think that's a starting point to fix some of these problems 
Well, if, if the world is not overpopulated now, it soon will be. Uh, resources are finite. The planet is finite. But man's capacity to reproduce is, uh, is up there. It's, it's actually in, it, technically exponential, but of course you, you've got all these factors weighing against it. Uh, and yes, per pressures uh, build as population increases and resources become more scarce. Do you think that the world is uh, in crisis? Is there global warming? Is there climate change? And if so, what does that mean for the next, say, 10 or 20 years? Well, you'd better believe there's climate change. Of course, the direction in which that change is happening it has not been established uh, to my satisfaction. I know there are a number of theories on this, and there are a number of models that indicate it's going one way or the other. And also, I think the causation is in many ways ambiguous. I think that uh, a lot of what we see on the climate change front is economically driven. I think there's a lot of money to be made from it, and mm. uh, that's where we have a conflation of factors there. Mm. Now, how about this chemtrail phenomenon? Have you been following that? Well, uh, we've got a ranch out here, and I can say, I mean, there have been uh, there have been cloud seeding programs. Every state in the union has a cloud seeding program, and it would not surprise me if there were a federal equivalent of that program. And uh, there are days on the ranch here, and we're a hundred miles away from the nearest airport when the, the sky is literally festooned with uh, what look like persistent contrails. So, if that's what you're calling chemtrails, I'd have to say there may be something to it. Mm, interesting. All right, let's go back to the phones, Ethan from Saskatchewan, Canada. Welcome to Coast to Coast AM. Hi, thank you so much for getting me in there. Yeah. I just want to say, uh, Dr. Langan, thank you for just being you and for, you know, personifying intelligence in the modern day to the best of your abilities. Well, thank you so much. <laughs> um, my question is really simple. I just want, well, it's not at all, but how, what, what, what importance does philosophy have in, your, in a, view, a person's view of science and understanding and vice versa if possible? Uh, people have forgotten where science came from. Originally, the, the mother of all disciplines, of all intellectual uh, disciplines, is philosophy. And both mathematics and science have sprung from philosophy. And unfortunately, there's been a divergence of the two. They need to be brought back together. And philosophy has the toolkit, the, uh, the set of, of instruments that will enable that to happen. Uh, I'm not talking about academic philosophy, which is kind of straight away from what philosophy should be. I'm talking about philosophy as it exists ideally, as it once existed and uh, could exist again. Hmm. Well, I've got to ask you, what are your thoughts on the future of mankind? We seem to be so vulnerable and so capable of mass destruction. Where do you see it going, Christopher? Well, we're at a crossroads. Uh, we talked earlier about the pressures created by overpopulation and so forth. There are a number of these pressures being created, and uh, we're approaching a brick wall of sorts, and we're, gonna, uh, we're either going to smack into that wall or we're going to vault it. And in order to vault it, we're, we're going to need a, a universe, universal worldview that everybody shares and that uh, will allow everybody to get on the same, uh, same wavelength and uh, love one another and uh, and evolve the spirit of cooperation that will carry us into the future. And I think that if we can do that, we're going to be just fine. All right. I'm encouraged. Uh, we'll tell people a little bit about your foundation as we're just coming up to the uh, closing end. So if they want to get involved and, and they can find out a little more information about it. Uh, yes. <clears throat> the Mega Foundation was established in uh, 1999. Uh, we uh, uh, have a number of programs, have typically run a number of programs for gifted people, both uh, including children and adults. We're in a kind of a state of limbo right now because uh, we, we purchased a building for a media center, and now we're in the process of, uh, of uh, remodeling that building and uh, 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 extending the construction. Uh, and uh, also building a separate building apart from it in order to get more space. And once we get everything up and running in that way, we're going to uh, go out at both barrels again. Mm. And where can people find you on the web? Uh, well, we have a number of websites, and I believe one of them is linked to your program. Mm -hmm. And uh, just give that out so people can have that. Uh, just a moment. <clears throat> is that the ctmu.org? Well, ctmu.org is one of those sites, www, of course, okay. ctmu.org. Okay. We'll go with that one. Well, Christopher, I really appreciate you coming on on such short notice. And I know that there's a lot to talk to, but I'm sure I speak for everybody when we say thank you very much. And we you know, hope that you'll continue your philanthropy. Uh, well, uh, we certainly will try. Uh, and uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. And uh, we'll talk to you again sometime. Thanks so much. Well, folks, there you have it. A interview with the smartest man in America. 200 IQ. Wow, that goes down in history for me, folks. When we come back, and for the rest of the show, it's open lines, and I'm going to tell you some very interesting things that are happening in the news. My name is Rob Simone. 
You're listening to Coast to Coast AM.